This is the story of Clara Immerwahr. Not many of us recognize the name, relatively to her husbands. Her husband, a Nobel Prize winner, a hero who saved humanity from massive starvation, a legendary scientist, but at the same time being a scientist of death, a totalitarian patriot, and an inventor of modern chemical warfare, was Fritz Haber of Prussia. She was mostly covered under the shadows of her husband's shining reputation, but in fact, she is the one that should be credited of the brightness. It is never easy for a girl to decide in her early days, especially in the end of the 19th century, to live her own life. When her teachers expected her to behave in the manner of a stereotypical woman of the era, she showed her bravery to express her anger without fear. She refused Haber's initial proposal, desiring to be economically independent before getting married. Being alone, she was able to continue walking her path of becoming a ke professional chemist, passing the notorious Van der Waxen exam and achieving magna cum laude at the end of her doctoral days. She was always the pioneer and a hope for the woman in Prussia. But at last, she met the glass ceiling in the richest science society that resultantly forced her to marry Fritz Haber. Yet the marriage life, it seemed, didn't turn out so well for her. Clara wrote to her friend, It has always been my attitude that a life has only been worth living if one has made full use of all one's abilities and tried to live out every kind of experience human life has to offer. It was under that impulse, among other things, that I decided to get married at the time. The life I got from it was very brief. And the main reasons for that was Fritz's oppressive way of putting himself first in our home and marriage, so that a less ruthlessly self-assertive personality was simply destroyed. This unstable equilibrium between those two shattered down when totalitarian ideas simmered into Prussia. They had a son, but this young boy just wasn't enough to convince a woman scientist who pledged in a doctoral degree ceremony that, I will not from now on, teach or make a speech about what I don't think is right. I'll keep the science as a wonderful way to pursue truth, not against humanity. She witnessed Fritz directly contradicting her noble belief. He was a Prussian citizen and a soldier, before a scientist and a savior of humanity. He became the role chemist in developing chemical weapons for the upcoming invasion war. She condemned her husbands for utilizing a barbaric misuse of human intellect. On April 22, 1915, the diabolic yellow mist loomed out to the French troop hiding under the deep trench. It was the first historical moment of the Second Battle of Ypres, when 5,700 cans of sodium gas were deployed in the midst of insanity. Briefly. 5,000 French men were fr instantly suffocated to death in agony. The rest of them, the unfortunate survivors, became temporarily blind and a captive of a Prussian force. It was both a shining victory of modern chemistry and an official debut of a rookie genocide war criminal called Fritz Haber. Party after party were held to celebrate this victory in Germany, but Clara never showed up for this insane celebration and a declaration of com corrupted human dignity. She never appeared, even in the town celebration for the proud and heroic return of her husband. My spouse was a pacifist, a pacifist who witnessed what she couldn't bear being committed by me. She took my pistol out of my jacket, but she was a pacifist after all. She stood still for a while, paused looking at a combination of metal that chronically carries the burden of the blood of his target. She took a deep breath and decided to go out to the garden. Maybe for a walk or fresh air. Maybe not. The morning had not fully awakened itself yet and the crisp air full of tension. She slowly pointed at the caliber to her head, staring at her betrayed husband's root. And bang! My boy ran out for the garden, frightened but there was nothing he could do for his dying mother. She died with her eyes open rigid, as if she was trying to deliver some sort of message to me. 
but I was Prussian before a scientist and a caring husband. I left the right to a coming attack at the Eastern Front, where my creations would be used to achieve precious victory in the cost of contaminated blood. No newspaper headlines, no gossips from the magazines, no official governmental mentions. Only a small local newspaper column indifferently reporting the reason for the sad woman's death is unknown. Nobody cared about her rigid persecution toward non-violent science. Nobody cared about her unfortunate inner struggle that was never coped with. Nobody cared. They were too busy preparing themselves to be sacrificial lamb of a totalitarian country. The only person who knew the danger of these zealots, ironically, killed herself. She, after some time, became the icon of civil resistance and woman rights of education. She inspired her followers to stand up against what contradicts their beliefs and to venture through undiscovered paths not taken. But what we must really not forget is that her life was not full of roses but rather of thorns. Nevertheless, she, until the very last moment of her life, chose to be faithful and fruitful to herself.